Now let me introduce the other person who has put World War I in the Middle East really on the stage, and that is Eugene Rogan. And he has three virtues that I want to speak about today. And his first virtue was that he was my roommate at Harvard when we both started our graduate study. And he taught me how to cook. Uh, in fact, we both taught each other how to cook because we entertained almost every weekend as a, have a, on Garden Street where we had a little apartment. And uh, he taught me how to make moule marinier, which I still make today occasionally, and, um, and many other delicious dishes. And Eugene has used those skills, social charm, cooking, to become an institution builder. At Oxford, he has single-handedly raised about three million pounds to build a new building for St. Anthony's, where he is the director of Middle Eastern Studies, and, um, and to get the funding to keep it uh, funded every year. But most importantly, his virtue is his academic smarts. And of all the people in my generation who came out of graduate school, Eugene has been by far the most successful. And he has taught us how to write for popular market. His first books were real scholarly books, but his The Arabs really broke out of the genre and sold tons of copies. The present book about which he's talking, The Fall of the Ottomans, The Great War in the Middle East, is now in its eighth printing. And Eugene got the bad news just a few weeks ago. His publisher said, we're not going to bring it out in paperback anytime soon because it's selling so well. It's in its eighth edition, and it sold thousands of copies. And they're making too much money to bring it out in paperback. So. I guess, you know, you can get bad news like that sometimes as an academic. It's been translated to 15 languages, and um, it's really a blockbuster. So it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and um, really my exemplar, Eugene Rogan. After an introduction like that, you kind of wish that the ice water was a bourbon. <laughs> I am genuinely speechless, but I feel it's incumbent on me to invite you all home for dinner after the lecture. <laughs> but I would like to echo one thing that Joshua Landis has said, one of the truer things that he said in that very generous introduction, which is that the place of the Middle East in the First World War has really come out in the past few years in a way that was unthinkable before. I would argue that we're moving, even today, from familiar terrain of the Western Front, the part of the Great War, a great war that drew America most directly in, to one of the most exotic and least known fronts, which would be that of the Ottoman Empire. And though it's one of the least known fronts, I would say that the Middle East was really essential in expanding what started out as a European conflict into a fully-fledged world war. There were skirmishes in the Pacific, in East Africa, but they were nothing compared to the four years of long-drawn battles and trench warfare that marked the Great War in the Middle East. So it was, in that sense, uh, a much more international part of uh, the war that started out in Eastern Europe. It was also a place of intensely international armies. In the Ottoman front, Turks and Arabs and Kurds and Germans and Austrians made war against Australians and New Zealanders, against virtually every ethnicity of the Indian subcontinent, against Moroccans and Algerians and Tunisians, Senegalese and Malians, the Irish, the English, the Scots, the Welsh, not to forget the French. It turned the Ottoman front into a veritable Tower of Babel. It was the most international of all the war fronts of the Great War. So the Middle East was absolutely decisive in the making of the First World War. And of course, the war reciprocated the honor. The First World War was absolutely essential in the making of the modern Middle East. For one thing, nearly every state of the modern Middle East was drawn into that conflict in one way or another. If you just move across North Africa, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, all sent 
conscripted soldiers to serve with the French, some of whom later served uh, through prisoner of war camps, changed sides and fought with the Ottoman army. Libya, Egypt were both battlefields. Um, moved down the Arabian Peninsula, the modern kingdom of Saudi Arabia, battlefield, home of the Arab revolt. Yemen, battlefield. Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Israel and the Palestinian territories. Iraq, major battlefield. Bahrain, launching point of war. Iran, major battlefield. And of course, Turkey itself. So though you don't think of the Middle East when you think of the First World War, the impact of that war on the region was absolute and it was across the board. But it was perhaps the aftermath of the war that was going to be the most decisive and enduring legacy on the Middle East because it was the moment when the multinational, multi-sectarian empire, the Ottoman Empire, was to be replaced by a modern state system, not arrived at in Wilsonian terms through a process of self-determination, but rather through a process of wartime partition diplomacy that evolved over the course of the war and was very much shaped by the exigencies of that war. Starting in March of 1915, the little remembered Constantinople Agreement in which Russia staked its claim to the Ottoman capital of Istanbul or Constantinople and the strategic waterways linking the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, the Straits of the Bosphorus, the Sea of Marmara, and the Straits of the Dardanelles. They did so just on the eve of an invasion of those straits, and they wanted to make sure that no other power was to beat Russia to what it saw as its long-standing historic desiderata in Ottoman territory. The French had their desires as well, and as the Allies met to start talking about divvying up Ottoman territory, France was quick to concede Russia's wishes to Constantinople and the Straits, but made its own claim to territory in Cilicia and in Syria. No clear boundaries on those territories, but this too, Russia and Britain were happy to concede to the French. It's interesting to note that as of March of 1915, when this Constantinople Agreement was finalized, that Britain really didn't know what territory it sought from the Ottoman Empire. Thanks to this document, we can actually say the British entered the First World War in the Middle East without any territorial ambitions. But they were balance of power empire sort of guys. So they reserved a right without prejudice to claim equally strategic territory once they'd made up their minds. <laughs> Believe it or not, that was the way they framed the Constantinople Agreement. And I bring it to your attention today because you'll hear the word Sykes-Picot so often. And what I'd like to leave you with before we finish today's lecture is a sense that Sykes-Picot is not in itself particularly relevant, but it's rather part of a process of this wartime partition diplomacy that really begins in March 1915 on the eve of the Gallipoli campaign with that first agreement. That was, of course, followed, if we take the evolution of the wartime partition diplomacy, by the secret negotiations conducted by the British and the Sharifs of Mecca, known as the Hussein McMahon Correspondence, which straddles the years 1915 and 1916, in which basically Britain promises to respect the creation of an Arab kingdom in natural boundaries as established by the Sharifs, excluding certain territories that the British maintained weren't entirely Arab along the coast of Syria and Cilicia in a way to try and honor their commitments to the French under the Constantinople Agreement, and carving out for themselves an area that had been a growing sphere of influence for Britain around Mesopotamia or modern Iraq where British troops had landed. But aside from those exclusions, Hussein McMahon created a wartime alliance in which Britain promised to recognize an Arab kingdom in return for the Arabs rising up and creating an internal uh, front or revolt against the Ottoman Empire. The wartime diplomacy continued immediately after Hussein McMahon because no sooner did Britain make such promises to the Arabs than it realized it needed the French to put some specific boundaries on that Cilicia and Syria that they'd claimed at Constantinople. That's the background of Sykes-Picot. That was all it was about, to get the French to actually set the boundaries so that Britain wouldn't queer relations with the French while trying to make new allies with the Arabs. And that takes place 100 years ago now, actually, in 1916. The next major milestone in this wartime partition diplomacy, of course, comes in 1917 when the British have just broken through the southern frontiers of Palestine and broken through Ottoman lines.
when the British government gives its support to the Zionist movement for the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine. It looks very much as though the British were promising Palestine to the Zionists. I submit to you it was rather the British using the Zionist movement as a tool to renegotiate one part of Sykes-Picot that the British government knew was not in its interest, having just fought a long, hard war through the Sinai to try and break through the southern frontiers of Palestine. That war experience had taught the British that you could not defend the Suez Canal from the Sinai. Uh, the dry wastelands would not allow you to billet troops there. You needed to hold Palestine to secure Egypt. Britain's wartime demands were changing. The Zionist movement was a useful ally to renegotiate terms with the French. And if we want to talk about the map of the modern Middle East, and I know we're going to be doing more of that in the next session to follow, I would say that the process of wartime partition diplomacy reaches its culmination in April of 1920 as part of the Paris Peace Conference when Britain and France, with the Italians and Japanese as onlookers, have a side meeting in San Remo to agree on the final divvying up of the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire. And it's at that moment that France secures Syria and Lebanon, Britain secures Iraq, Palestine, which included Transjordan, as mandates to be decided by the new League of Nations. So there's the process of wartime partition. The fact is the borders left by that process, with very few exceptions, have survived down to the present day. So they've been stable boundaries that have left very unstable relations in the Middle East that have left the region one of the most volatile in the 20th century, and escalating conflict has led to a re-questioning those boundaries in the 21st century. But all of that tells you why the Middle East is significant to the Great War, why World War I was such a decisive moment in Middle Eastern history. But it still leaves two questions that I'd like to explore with you today. And the first really is, if this was a European conflict, why did the Ottomans enter Europe's war? And if the Ottoman front was a sideshow, whatever drew the British away from their emphasis on the Western front to engage in the Ottoman front? Well, let me turn first to the Ottomans' entry into the war. For the Ottomans, it was very clear they had no interests in the war that unraveled following the assassination in Sarajevo. In fact, since 1908, the Ottoman Empire had endured a revolution and three fairly catastrophic wars before 1914. In 1911, they lost a war to Italy, which was a war of conquest for the Ottoman provinces of Libya. In 1912, the Ottomans fell to a group of their successor states in the Balkans, countries like Greece and Bulgaria and Serbia and Montenegro. Not great powers. Actually, in Ottoman terms, small bit players, places that used to be provinces, had cobbled together and had proven their ability to defeat their old imperial master and drive the Ottomans out of nearly every bit of European territory they held in Thrace, in Macedonia, and in Albania. The catastrophic First Balkan War was followed by a Second Balkan War, which was when the Confederacy of Balkan states fell out among themselves over the partitioning of Balkan territories won from the Ottomans, and the Ottomans took advantage of that opening to march in to reclaim some of their lost territory, notably the city of Adrianople or Edirne, and were able to win back that little bit of Thrace that we still associate with the map of the Republic of Turkey today. So they actually came out of the Second Balkan War ahead, but if you were sitting in Istanbul in the summer of 1914, the last thing in the world you wanted to contemplate was another war, let alone a war against the greatest powers of the day. By 1914, not only was the Ottoman Empire militarily worn out, but its economy was exhausted by years of war mobilization. So its top priorities in 1914 were rebuilding, rebuilding its army, for which a German military mission had been appointed already at the end of 1913. Rebuilding its navy, which had been left in the hands of a British mission since 1912. Rebuilding its economy. And here, the French government made a very important 
development loan to the Ottomans in the spring of 1914 for 100 million US dollars. It was an enormous loan. It was seen as throwing an economic lifeline to allow the Turks to begin to rebuild their infrastructure and, uh, and their industry. And if it had any further ambitions of reconstruction, it had to do with regaining territories lost to the Greeks in the Balkan Wars. In fact, if there's anybody that the Ottomans were thinking about going to war with in 1914, it would have been Greece over certain Aegean islands very close to the shore of Turkey that they'd lost in the Balkan Wars and were not reconciled to having lost. No, in the summer of 1914, as Europe began to go to war, the Ottomans had no interest in getting involved in that war. What they wanted to do was to try and secure a defensive alliance to protect their territory against the ambitions of the one power with whom they did not have good relations. You've already seen that they've got the British helping with their navy, the French with their economy, the Germans with their army, but it's their old adversary, Russia, that's going to draw them into the First World War. Because as early as February of 1914, in light of the instability in Ottoman Balkan territory, Russia had made a policy decision to secure Constantinople and the Straits. As we saw, they formalized that with their allies the following year. But this was not a secret to the Ottomans in 1914. They knew that in the context of a generalized European war, Russia was counting on the fog of war to cover their land grab for the Ottoman capital city and its strategic waterways. And with war beginning to unfold in Europe, the Ottomans were absolutely desperate to try and secure the alliance that would protect their territory against Russian ambitions. And to make a long story short, though they tried knocking on the door of Britain and France, you weren't really going to enter into a mutual treaty of alliance with two of the Entente powers against the third member of the Entente. There was no way Britain and France would ally with the Ottomans against the Russians or go to war against the Russians to protect Ottoman territory. And so the list really did come down to a short list of one. The candidate was Germany as the only realistic option. Now, Germany, as I already mentioned, knew the Ottoman Empire from up close. It was heading up the military mission for the reconstruction of the Ottoman army. It had been deeply involved in infrastructural developments such as the Baghdad Railway Project. This meant that Germany knew how weak the Ottoman army and economy was, actually. And there were many voices in the German embassy in Istanbul, writing back to Berlin to say, the Ottomans would be nothing but a liability to us. If we were to enter into an alliance with this country, they would drain our treasury and drag us down. They cannot contribute to the war effort militarily. But there were others who had the ear of the Kaiser, who had persuaded him that the Ottomans held a secret weapon. And here I'm going to revert back to the subject of this morning's excellent lecture by Philip to talk about the reverse side of the crusade, which was, of course, the jihad. There were influential voices in German circles who believed that the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, in his role as caliph of not just Ottoman Muslims, but of the global community of Muslims, or the global ummah, had the power to summon not just his own people, but Muslims everywhere to rise in jihad against the enemies of the Ottoman Empire. If you could harness this latent power of the Ottomans to unleash worldwide jihad against Russia, Britain, and France, you could weaken the Entente through their colonial possessions, which were peopled with millions of Muslims. In India, Somewhere between 65 and 80 million Muslims lived under British rule. In Egypt, between 15 and 20 million. In French North Africa, another 20 million. In the Russian Caucasus, over 10 million. You could imagine if by a single edict by the Sultan Caliph that these millions of colonial Muslims might rise up against their colonial masters, how Britain, France, and Russia would be weakened at the crucial Western and Eastern fronts by having to try and put out colonial fires in their empires. So to secure an alliance with the Ottoman Empire, Germany is willing to go the whole way, providing them with millions in bullion and unlimited supplies of 
state-of-the-art artillery and guns and ammunition and all the material of warfare. But in return, they demanded that the Ottomans not only had to enter the war, but they had to declare the jihad. That alliance was struck very early in the summer of 1914, on the 2nd of August, actually, as a secret alliance. And we witness over the summer months of 1914 a great deal of Ottoman foot-dragging that tells you a, a lot about what the Ottomans hoped might actually happen, that the German war of motion would sweep through to an early victory and that the Ottomans might reap the benefit of the alliance with Germany without actually having to engage in the war. But after three months of such foot-dragging, the Ottomans were driven into starting hostilities by German naval vessels reflagged as Turkish ships who engaged with the Russians in the Black Sea and drew the Ottomans into the war in the beginning of November of 1914. And after a couple of weeks, the Sultan, after a certain amount of prompting from Germany, carried out that last part of the deal. And after finding a way to make such a thing as a targeted jihad, thou Muslims shall rise up against all Russians, French, and British, but will not, of course, kill any Austrians or Germans or Bulgarians, please. <laughs> Something of an innovation in Islamic theology. After they'd sorted out how to make a targeted jihad, the Sheikh al Islam pronounced in the Sultan's name the necessary formula. And I would argue that it was jihad, the other side of crusade, that drew Great Britain into what it always declared to be the sideshow of the Ottoman front. You see, Britain was very concerned about Muslim loyalties, particularly in India and in Egypt. From the very opening of the war, the government of India had been very concerned about how to calm relations among the Muslim population in the event Britain should find itself at war against the Ottoman Empire. And the British were increasingly unwelcome guests in Egypt, They'd been in occupation of that country since 1882. Egypt had witnessed the emergence of very eloquent nationalists who had played on the way in which British rule was weighing and taxing on the Egyptians and how they had, through their years of good governance, earned their right to independence. So you couldn't really say that the Muslims of India or Egypt would not pay heed to an Ottoman sultan's call to jihad. And the British were very concerned to try and calm things down and demonstrate that the Ottomans were not seriously in this war as soon as possible. I think the British jitters were only heightened when in February of 1915, so just three months after the declaration of jihad, some 500 sepoys or Muslim Indian soldiers mutinied in Singapore and for a week ran amok, killing scores of British civilians and soldiers before loyal troops could be dispatched to put down the uprising in Singapore. They did so in direct response to the Ottoman Sultan's call for jihad. And I think for the British, the idea that Indian soldiers as far away from Ottoman Turkey as Singapore might respond to the call meant that Muslims anywhere could. So it put them very much on their edge and was very much important in the drive to knock the Ottoman Empire out of the First World War as soon as possible, and in so doing, put to rest the threat of jihad. And I think that that really helped to contribute to the urgency with which Britain entered into the Gallipoli campaign, an effort to seize the Dardanelles, force the Straits, so that Entente shipping could proceed and secure the Ottoman capital, thereby producing the defeat of the Ottomans in short order, would, they hoped, bring an end to the threat of jihad. But as we all know, Gallipoli did not go to plan. On the 18th of March, after weeks of attempting to try and clear the Straits of Mines, the British government, led to, uh, here by the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, bid for a naval attempt to try and force the Straits. Down the torpedoes, let the dreadnoughts force their way through. By the end of that day, they had just delivered the Ottomans their first military victory of the First World War. The British and French lost six ships sunk or damaged beyond use, six of their very biggest dreadnoughts actually, and um, gave the Ottomans important time to rebuild the defenses around the Straits before the anticipated beach landing. That left the Allies really little more than a month from the 18th of March to the 20th of April to try and organize something unprecedented, 
a complex beach landing on a place with no landing jetties, with very inaccurate maps, with no sense of the prevailing tides around headwaters that were uh, filled with strong currents. And the Allies knew the longer they took to launch the Gallipoli campaign, the more time they left the Germans and the Ottomans to defend their positions. In this race with time, we know the results were quite tragic for both sides. For on the 25th of April, you had the series of very bloody beach landings through which Britain and France managed to secure narrow beachheads at the price of very high casualties to both the attackers and the defenders. But after eight months of what was to prove the most hellish trench warfare of the entire First World War, veterans who served on the Western Front and at Gallipoli were all in agreement that because the land they held was so narrow and because there was no back country to fall back on after a period of service at the front, the relentless presence of death in Gallipoli, the relentless machine gun fire, the relentless shrapnel from artillery, made Gallipoli the living hell of the First World War. And after eight months of it, it was the Ottomans who had won. The Allies were forced into uh, an evacuation. The best thing about which they could say was they managed to withdraw every one of their soldiers without a single casualty. Uh, they'd anticipated very heavy casualties in trying to withdraw. But what has just happened was that the British had just uh, delivered a massive victory to the Ottoman Empire. And remember, they were in a hurry to go into Gallipoli to deal the Ottomans a death blow to give the lie to the Jihad. Now they've just blown fresh life into the Jihad because obviously God was siding with the Muslims against the infidels in protecting Holy Land. Whitehall genuinely feared that this Ottoman victory might caused such trouble in India and in Egypt that they felt it imperative to try and deal a, a, a defeat to the Ottomans in the nearest next front. And that happened to be in Iraq, or in Mesopotamia, as they still called it, where British troops at the very beginning of the war had secured the city of Basra and the oil resources in the Shat al-Arab, but then had opportunistically extended their rule up the Tigris to Kut al -Amara, and up the Euphrates to Nasiriya to hold all of the province of Basra. With those troops so close to Baghdad, you could see the temptation for the war planners in Whitehall. We've been humiliated in Gallipoli, but we can deal the Sultan Caliph a blow by taking the fabled city of Baghdad, once the seat of the Abbasid Caliphs. This clearly would be the kind of prize that would compensate for Allied defeat in Gallipoli. But it was a cruel irony that said the more successful the British had been in advancing up the rivers of Mesopotamia, the weaker they became. Because their line of communication grew longer, the numbers smaller, and the chance of relief harder. And as they advanced at the orders of the British government from Kut el Amara to try and engage the Ottomans and take the city of Baghdad, the British found themselves brought to a stop at the decisive battle of Ketesiphon, otherwise known as Salman Pak, on the outskirts of Baghdad, and driven into a retreat under hostile fire. The British withdrew in, um, in the November of 1915 uh, to the bend in the river that they had formerly held at Kut el Amara, knowing full well that they would be besieged in that location but were confident that from Kut they could protect their men while awaiting the inevitable relief column that would break through Ottoman lines and would deliver them from the siege. And of course, Kut was to prove Great Britain's second massive defeat in the Ottoman front. After 145 days of siege, withstood by the Ottomans against every effort by British relief columns to try and break through Ottoman lines and free the men trapped in Kut. After every effort to try and resupply these men by running steamships up the Tigris through chains laid by the Ottomans, they even for the first time tried to do airdrops of food supplies to try and bring food to the starving soldiers besieged in Kut. Uh, airdrops being a very imprecise art in 1916. I have many Ottoman diaries of soldiers who applauded the British for dropping their sacks of flowers on the Ottoman sides of the line. On the 29th of April 1916, General Townshend 
delivered his sword to Halil Pasha, the commander of Ottoman forces, and with that, 480 British and Indian officers and 13,000 British and Indian men surrendered totally to the Ottoman Empire. Britain was then helpless as it watched thousands of its soldiers being either death-marched or put into labor gangs, humiliated once powerful Britons, now the kind of symbolic power of the Ottoman Empire and of the appeal of jihad. Further setback only drew the British deeper, deeper into the sideshow of the Ottoman front. In fact, it's at this point that they're drawn into what Lawrence of Arabia famously referred to as the sideshow of the sideshow of the Arab revolt. Because the British had no further armies that might deal a defeat to the Ottomans in Ottoman territory. They'd been held in Gallipoli, they'd lost in Kutilamara, and so they turned to the alliance with the Sharifs of Mecca, already referred to, negotiated by that correspondence with Sir Henry McMahon. Now, the idea was if you could get the senior most religious figures in the Arab world, the Sharifs of Mecca were the highest religious authority in the holiest city of Islam. Mecca, the sort of original city of Islam and the place where the Prophet Muhammad first revealed the religion to the faithful. This was, in the words of George Antonius, the most powerful thunderbolt in the whole jihad strategy. If you could win over Sharif Hussein to an Arab revolt against his Ottoman sovereign, then you would be undermining the credibility of the Sultan and Caliph and weakening the jihad effort. But the Arab revolt revealed the contradictions of these British counter-jihad policies. At the very start of the war, and you may recall, I said that the British were concerned about public opinion among Indian Muslims. The British had made a pledge at the start of the war that they would protect the holy cities of Islam in the Arabian province of the Hejaz from being a theater of operations. They'd use all of their naval resources to protect these cities. Now they were up against a revolt which having broken out with a certain amount of revolutionary elan, as any of you who've read Lawrence's Seven Pillars of Wisdom will recall, immediately ran into trouble because they had a certain number of regular soldiers fighting with them. They were reliant mostly on irregular Bedouins, and I emphasize the word irregular. And against them was a garrison of 15 to 20,000 regular Ottoman soldiers in the neighboring city of Medina. And they'd come out of Medina and they're hunting down the Hashemites and their Bedouin allies are beginning to disappear into the desert and the British are faced with a very real possibility that this revolt that they have endorsed and are supporting, and that was to be their counter-pressure against the Ottoman Jihad, was going to be defeated by the Ottomans. And if the Ottomans were to recover Mecca from the Hashemites and put an end to the Arab revolt, then the British really feared that that would be the end of their options for stopping the Jihad from coming to India and Egypt. But what do you do when you promised Indian Muslims you're not going to land troops or engage Mecca and Medina as theaters of operations? So British, Britain could not deploy troops to aid the Sharifs, but if the Ottomans defeated the Hashemites and restored their control over Mecca, it would promote the Jihad. In the end, Britain decided that it was going to come up with a compromise solution. It limited itself to providing naval support, and at one point that was quite crucial parking four or five British warships with their guns pointing to shore, protected the Arab armies that had gathered on the shoreline from the advancing Ottoman troops that did not want to come into the range of fire of those British naval guns. They extended the technical support and actually did have some British boots on the ground. Obviously, Lawrence was one of them. There were a handful of these men. They brought airplanes to counter the German airplanes that had been deployed by the Ottomans. They brought Rolls-Royce cars with mounted machine guns. They brought some uh, mobile artillery batteries, and they brought technicians to train Arab uh, fighters in how to use these. They brought Egyptian soldiers who could be deployed in the Hejaz without it bringing non-Muslims into the war. They brought gold and guns to try and help the Sharifs of Mecca retain the loyalties of their highly irregular Bedouins. And in this way, they um, were able to 
uh, keep the revolt going as a, an internal operation against the Ottoman Empire and prop up their Hashemite allies. By 1917 then, Britain, which really never had wanted to get involved in the Ottoman front at all, had found itself engaged, not just in its defeated uh, expeditions in Gallipoli, but in the Hejaz, in the Sinai, where it was laying a railway track and pipeline through the desert to try and foster a reconquest of that territory, in Iraq, where after the defeat at Kut, the British remobilized to try and resume their advance. They were engaged in minor campaigns in Egypt's western desert, when Senussi tribesmen had come over across the Libyan frontier to attack British positions in alliance with the Ottomans. And they were trying to defend their coaling station in Aden against a, um, a, an Arab and Ottoman alliance. It was, in other words, a very deep venture into the sideshow. But 1917 was a turning point. As I said, uh, the British had remassed and it re renewed their assault in Mesopotamia. In March of 1917, Britain managed to complete the conquest of Baghdad with Maud's entry into the city. Uh, in March of 1917, Britain could finally claim a significant victory on the Ottoman front. But in the immediate aftermath of that, they were dealt two very serious blows in March and in April 1917 at the southern gates of Palestine when the Ottomans defeated the British in the first and second battles of Gaza. In July of 1917, famous moment in Lawrence of Arabia, the movie, uh, Lawrence and his Arab partners managed with a very small number of uh, tribal irregulars to conquer the fort in Aqaba from the Ottomans that allowed the whole center of operations of the Arab revolt to move to the southern shores of Syria. And Allenby, the new commander of British forces in Egypt, conceived of a new Palestine campaign where once he could break through Ottoman lines in southern Palestine with the Arab revolt in Aqaba as his eastern flank, they would advance up both sides of the Jordan River in a sort of pincer movement towards Damascus. With this in mind, we see Allenby launch a successful uh, bid in Palestine while the Arab revolt was held more or less in check by the Ottomans. The Arab revolt failed to capture any major territories after Aqaba. They, they tried to take the Ottoman railhead at Man, but were held back by the Ottomans. The most you could say about the strategic value of the Arab revolt was not that it achieved the pincer role Allenby had held for it, but that it succeeded in pinning down some 20,000 Ottoman troops in points south of Amman. And those are 20,000 troops who might have been better deployed in the defense of Palestine or of Damascus. So it, it was far from a useless contribution to the war, but certainly not the great strategic uh, help that Allenby had hoped it might prove to be. But Allenby, in fact, did not need it. And by ruse, he managed in October to break through Ottoman lines in Beersheba and following that in Gaza in November on a drive to take Jerusalem which he succeeded in entering on the 9th of December of 1917. So by the end of 1917, Britain had pretty well put paid to its prime driver for entering the Ottoman front. There was no sting left in the jihad by the beginning of 1918. The Ottomans had lost Mecca to the Sharifs. They lost Baghdad to the British in March of 1917. And in December of 1917, they'd lost Jerusalem. And so it no longer looked as though the momentum of war favored the jihad it looked as though the British and the Arabs were now on the ascendant. The Ottomans were down, but they weren't out. They still fought a tremendously tenacious war right through the months of 1918. They dealt the British two further defeats in Transjordan, in the first and second Transjordan raid, before Allenby actually achieved the major breakthrough in Palestine in the Battle of Megiddo in September and October of 1918 at which point British and Arab armies converged on Damascus on the 30th of September, and then you had that famous entry into Damascus on the 1st of October, 1918, which really marked the effective end of the Ottoman front. The remaining month of October was a march of triumph as British forces made their way up the rest of greater Syria, and the Ottomans, stopped by the speed of British movement from ever regrouping and defending a position, retired out of Arab territories entirely, they were never to return.
The armistice was concluded with the Ottoman Empire on the 31st of October. It's just worth noting that the power that everyone had assumed was the weakest link in the Central Powers chain only signed its armistice 11 days before the Germans exited the war. By the armistice, the Ottoman war effort had fully vindicated German expectations. It is true their war effort did not produce the global jihad that the Germans had hoped it might. But the Ottomans had succeeded in drawing Great Britain very deep into the Ottoman front for the full four years of the war, not out of any geostrategic concern so much as this fear of jihad. In that sense, I would argue that Britain proved itself far more responsive to the Sultan Caliph's call for jihad than did the global community of Islam. The Ottomans proved incredibly tenacious in defense of their territory for the four full years of the war. And in the course of that, they managed to divert hundreds of thousands of British and colonial and French and their colonial troops away from the Western Front or the Eastern Front, where everyone agreed the war would be won or lost, and drained away the tonnage of war material. And in the course of the war, that would include things like tanks, state-of-the-art aircraft, latest artillery, all the material it took to fight against so tenacious an enemy, and in the process, inflicted hundreds of thousands of casualties on the Entente. To give you just the casualty figures for Gallipoli alone, Britain committed 410,000 troops to the fight for the Dardanelles. The French, about 80,000. This is both metropolitan and colonial troops. So nearly a half million allied forces drawn into the fight for Gallipoli alone. And of course, they suffered tremendous casualties in that relentless hell of Gallipoli. Um, of those that Britain sent in and France sent in, 56,000 died, 200,000 were wounded. So out of a half million sent in, to over 10% die, and over 50% casualties overall. Of course, Ottoman losses were far greater. They fought heroically, but they suffered terrible casualties. Uh, they committed between 200 and, uh, about 400,000 troops, of which between 250 and 290,000 were taken as casualties, of which 86,500 died. So the carnage of the Ottoman front should never be forgotten when we talk about a secondary theater of operations. As a front, I think that it uh, was to prove in every way as lethal and as terrible as the great war in its industrial warfare was to prove everywhere. And if we were to add to Gallipoli the losses in Mesopotamia, in Sinai, in Palestine, in Syria, in Arabia, in Egypt, the magnitude of the First World War in the Middle East becomes apparent. Now, I'm going to leave until the next session for the discussion of the enduring legacy of that war. But I, I would say that in the way in which the war allowed Britain and France latitude to decide the fate of the Arab territories of the Ottoman Empire, we found in that whole partition diplomacy that the prime driver of Britain and France and their ally Russia had been balance of empire politics. It was a process of negotiating how much territory each of the allies might claim from Ottoman territories without upsetting the other allies. And the importance of those territories grew as the war became more bitter and more casualties were suffered. And these territories became sort of war prizes that might contribute to justifying the war effort. But what it meant was that when the British and the French, the Russians having through their revolution, exited all imperial claims on extra Russian territories, when they finally sat down to agree their final partition, what they had in mind was balancing the powers of Europe, not to achieve a stable Middle East. And it is in that sense that they were to leave us with the bitterest of legacies that would leave the Middle East the most volatile region to come out of the First World War, not just in the 20th century, but today in the 21st. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene.